Hey everybody, in this video we're going to talk about how we can use multispectral satellite imagery to, to distinguish different rock types or lithologies. And I know what you're thinking, oh man, another video in the online sequence. Will it ever end? How do you think I feel? Found this little cartoon to lighten it up. Luke, you must learn the ways of the Force. I'm ready, Obi-Wan. Uh, okay, let's see here. Uh, after you've logged in, you've got to go to the student portal, go to the YouTube channel, then download the data, open QGIS. Oh my god. Okay, but seriously, um, this video is going to be about uh, reflectance of photons and spectral reflectance. If you've never heard about this stuff, you probably want to watch this video, which really goes through the basics. But as a refresher, um, in remote sensing, we're often trying to identify and discriminate materials based on the exact wavelength at which they absorb photons, okay? And there's th the exact wavelength where you might get a photon absorption peak um, can be caused by three things. Um, for high energy photons, it's often electron transitions where a photon bumps an electron up to a higher energy level. For lower energy photons, we can also have vibrational resonances, where that photon uh, triggers vibration of a molecule. And then for gases, we can have rotation, uh, but these uh, don't happen in rocks because the molecules are attached to each other. They're bonded, and they're not free to rotate. So importantly, I use the word resonant that always means that the photon must match the required energy exactly. If the photon doesn't have the right energy, say to trigger a vibration of a carbonate ion, then it can't do it and it won't be absorbed. It'll be reflected. And that's what gives us these specific absorption peaks. So with that in mind, um, I just want to stress the idea that uh, rocks are made of minerals, okay? And it's really, we really end up thinking more about minerals when we think about the reflectance spectra of rocks, right? Um, the same way a chocolate chip cookie is really all about the chocolate chips, a rock is all about its constituent minerals. So the, a couple types we're going to come across today, one is calcium carbonate. That's the basis for limestone. You can see it's got the blue calcium, red oxygens, and the white uh, carbon. Here's illite. This is an example of a sheet silicate. This is also a clay mineral. Um, you can see we have sheets of silica tetrahedra here, um, which are a tetrahedra is four blue oxygens arranged around a silica or sometimes arranged around a red aluminum. And we have a few of these uh, hydroxyl groups, the OH, uh, sprinkled in around the crystal structure. And those are going to be important. And then over here we have hematite, an iron oxide mineral, where we've got uh, blue irons and red oxygens arranged in this kind of complex interlocking pattern. So the reason I chose to focus on these minerals is because, truthfully, um, it can be difficult to distinguish many common silicate minerals. And it's really these three that are some of the most easily distinguished uh, minerals in remote sensing. Um, and so just to go a little deeper, uh, carbonates, that calcium carbonate, um, that makes up limestones, marble, uh, makes up coral reefs, and also is common in evaporites, for example, lake beds. Um, and it contains this diagnostic carbonate group, the CO3 group. Uh, clay minerals, um, tend to be really diagnostic of low temperature weathering. Specifically, they are diagnostic of weathering of silicate minerals um, at the surface. They tend to be enriched in shales, which are fine-grained sedimentary rocks. Um, and again, it's going to be this diagnostic hydroxyl group that we're going to see is actually so important to identify clays. Iron oxides um, also are uh, informed by low temperature. Uh, dissolution and reprecipitation. So for example, in soils or in hydrothermal systems, iron can be leached out of silicate minerals. 
concentrated in fluids and then reprecipitated when those fluids dry and the iron combines with air to make iron oxides. Um, and in uh, iron oxides, we're going to see that it's really the crystal, it's, uh, the crystal fields around ferrous iron that are going to be really, really important in diagnostic. Okay, so let's look at the calcium carbonate here. Um, this carbonate ion has uh, vibrational resonances at 2.3, 7, and 11 microns. And I'm sorry I don't have this all on one plot for you, but here is a spectral reflectance curve. Here's wavelength in microns along the X. And we see dolomite limestone and mixed limestone all have this big dip right around uh, 7 microns, which is a uh, vibrational overtone with the carbonate ion. Then we got another big dip here at 11 microns. And then here it's the black line uh, with a big dip at uh, two point, near 2.3. Okay, now those uh, sheet silicates and clay minerals that contain the hydroxyl group, that also has a vibrational uh, overtone and combination tones near 1.4 microns and near 2.3 microns. So on these reflectance we, spectra, we see that um, the vibration of that hydroxyl group, the OH, is actually absorbing photons at these very specific wavelengths in creating these diagnostic dips. And if we can detect those dips in our remote sensing, then we can, we can tell that's a, a rock type that has a hydroxyl group in it. And then finally, here's those iron oxides. They have absorption bands uh, at 0, 0 0.9 and 2.9 microns. These are different. These are actually associated with electron transitions in the crystal field of ferrous iron. Um, there are so many electrons in the outer orbitals of the iron atom that actually it takes relatively little energy to drive an electron transition. So actually, it's one of the few uh, minerals where we do see electron transitions being important. So I won't go through this figure, but it's cool to have in your files or your mind. Um, it's a summary of lots of different minerals and their various absorption peaks. So each gray interval is an absorption peak for a specific mineral. And here it's showing um, which, uh, which element is driving that. So for example, in all of these, uh, beryl, bronzite, olivine, starlight, it's ferrous iron that is actually absorbing uh, photons with a crystal field effect. Um, here's another whole group in here, kind of inset. These are uh, sheet silicates and clay minerals mostly, um, and some, some carbonates that have uh, vibrational absorption peaks, just like what we just talked about. So this is a great summary. And I just want to finish with an example of how we might actually use this and exploit this to discriminate um, different rock types. And I want to, for this, I want to take you to the Saline Valley of California. This is in southeast California near, the, uh, near Death Valley. You can see it's very dry, no vegetation at all. So remote sensing gives us a good look at the rocks. And uh, so here's a picture. Um, and notice in this picture these white rocks over here, OK? These are sedimentary rocks, and we can probably tell that just based on their, mat, their outcrop pattern. They're showing this linear intersection with the topography, the exposures dipping back into this valley. So we get a sense these are probably sedimentary rocks just from how they're exposed. Um, and here they are actually in map view. This is a maybe close to a true color image. They're appearing white here. And they're coming along this kind of cliff band here. So suppose we want to know, OK, what kind of rocks are those actually? Well, what we can do is uh, experiment with false color imagery. In this case, I took an Aster satellite image. Actually, I'm not sure I did this, but someone did. Uh, and assigned false colors. So they assigned uh, band 4 to red, band 6 to green, and band 8 to blue. Now, importantly, if you look this up on Aster, 
you'll find band 4 is collected near 1.7 microns, 2.2 microns, and 2.3 microns. So these are relatively narrow spectral bands in the near infrared that actually are able to capture some of those peaks, uh, some of those absorption troughs, excuse me, that we just looked at. So when we assign these false colors to this image, right, turns out that this sedimentary rock actually is limestone, and we've made it turn yellow. And so how did I know it was limestone? Or how did I know it was going to turn yellow if I knew it was limestone? Well, here is the reflectance spectra for limestone, shown in blue here. Okay, And over that, I've superimposed the red, green, and blue uh, color assignments. Those were the aster bands. And you can see that the, I guess it was aster band 8, uh, falls right over an absorption trough in the limestone spectra. So that's one of those carbonate ion vibrational uh, resonances. And then the other two bands, the green and the red, fall uh, kind of at, at peaks in reflectance. So they fall at areas where there was no, where there was relatively little absorption going on. And of course, if we get a strong return in red, a strong return in green, red and green then mix to make a yellowish color. And that's how we were able to make this limestone pop out as a bright yellow while the surrounding rocks turned other various colors. So again, we exploited those specific absorption bands associated with the carbonate ion to distinguish limestone. OK, so in summary, We've seen that absorption peaks are caused by electron transitions and vibrational resonances in rocks in particular. Um, carbonate ion has vibrational resonances at 2.3, 7, and 11. Hydroxyl ion uh, in clays and sheet silicates has vibrational resonances at 1.4 and 2.3. Uh, ferrous iron in, say, hematite or gertite iron oxide minerals, has electron transitions near 0 0.9 and 1.9. And if we use the appropriate color assignments, we can render uh, lithologies into specific colors on our image. Thanks, everybody. Don't lose hope.